Yo, 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 yo. What it do? What it be? It's your boy, A N T, rapping the motherfucking game. Gang, you know we don't play none of that. And if you a lame, you just can't hang all of that. And y'all know me, I'm back with another one of my POVs of history. Recently, I've been covering a lot of the great conquerors in antiquity. And on these intros, I just tend to rhyme accidentally. That's just how it goes. I'm sorry, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I've done some research on Attila and Alexander the Great, but I don't think there's a more controversial figure or a controversial conqueror in ancient times than Genghis Khan. But to some, he's up there with some of the most evil men in history, and to others, he was a brilliant leader of one of the largest and most feared militaries in history. Now, there are good arguments for both, but let's look at some context. Y'all know context matters in everything because everything matters in context, especially when it comes to history. So, I'm going to look at the Mongol culture that Genghis was raised in and eventually led and examine his life to determine whether or not Genghis Khan was really just a barbarian hell-bent on death and destruction kind of like a devil without a cause except he wasn't trying to go platinum he was trying to take over shit or was he an evil genius who used fear and mental warfare as a facade to be a great conqueror and before we like i said before we talk about genghis khan the man let's look at the mongol culture and see the kind of environment that genghis khan was born and raised in now the mongol culture was very similar to the huns in the fact that they were a loose band of clans that didn't necessarily have their own spoken language they came from the steppe region of eurasia and they were very skilled archers on horseback now there wasn't really a definitive leader of the mongols until genghis khan came around So there was a lot of infighting and power struggles within the Mongol culture before Genghis rose to power, and alliances and friendships were often made through gift giving, and women were often kidnapped from other tribes and kept as literal trophy wives. Genghis's mother just so happened to be one of these women, and there's actually a story or a legend about Genghis's uh, birth. He was supposedly born holding a blood clot in his hand which according to mongolian legend that was a sign that he was going to be a great warlord which to me is a crazy kind of prophecy to even begin with because it's like yeah we don't know really what a blood clot is but if this baby comes out holding this piece of blood or whatever yeah he gonna be a problem y'all gotta watch out for him like how how do you even come up with some shit like that first of all and whether that's even true is up for debate because the mongolian and the huns carried similar traits and backgrounds and after doing research on both genghis and attila they do have a little sum in common see the fact is that there's not a lot of uh, mongolian sources on what genghis khan was actually like or really anything like that just like attila the hun who for the most most of our knowledge of attila comes from third party greek sources of that era and most of what we know about genghis khan comes from a book called the secret history of the mongols which is the most accurate and most significant piece of literature detailing not only genghis khan's early life or life in general but mongol culture as well and it was written for the mongol royal family after genghis's death but the exact year and date are unknown just like the author which is crazy to me that the author and the the date of one of the biggest historical books of, in history the the author and all that has just been lost to history in itself but the reason why i doubt the whole him being born holding a blood clot thing uh to be false or why i don't think it's true is because we don't even know his exact date of birth See, we think Genghis was born somewhere between 1155 and 1167 AD. That is a 12-year gap. Okay, you mean to tell me we don't know his exact birthday, but we know a minute detail of him holding a blood clot at his birth and no other, no, nothing else. Come on, I'm not really, I'm not really buying that legend. But his father was a, a, a Genghis Khan's father was a chieftain who had direct ancestry to the founders of Mongo, the Mongol nations, and his father had multiple wives. So he had three brothers, two half brothers, and one sister. And also, Genghis Khan was not his birth name. That was more of a title that he got after he became ruler of the Mongols, but his birth name was Temujin, and his siblings grew up on the banks of the the Onan River, him and his siblings, and when Temujin turned eight, his father took him to a neighboring tribe 
for a wife and if his pops was taking him to get a wife at eight years old and you can kind of imagine that Temujin was already doing man shit like hunting riding horses combat training all that so the eight-year-old man Temujin found himself a wife except his wife was the daughter of a chieftain and she was fetching a high price on the dowry market so in order to marry her he was going to be in debt to the chief and he had to work off this debt so he was on he was gonna stay with the with the chief and work off his debt but this didn't really last long because while his dad was on his way back from the neighboring tribe he was you know he was solo he was riding solo like jason derulo in op territory and he wasn't even on that he wasn't he wasn't trying to beef with nobody on his way back he was just trying to get some food, maybe like a burger or something, like the dude from Menace to Society, but not for real. His choices got him poisoned by the Tartars. I heard they had the sauce, but the Mongols turned their ass to martyrs. But yeah, basically, Genghis Khan's dad was in Tartarland, which was an ancient tribe that has nothing to do with the disgusting fish dipping sauce. But the Tartars recognized who he was and poisoned him on his way back home. Temujin was only around 10 and couldn't take his father's throne yet, so his father's death led to infight or I guess more infighting in the Mongol culture and Temujin's family's power was severely weakened as well and they were pretty much on their own as some if not all of the Mongol tribes had pretty much shunned his mother from the main Mongol camps so the family had to pretty much fend for themselves however as Temujin and his half-brother Batar both had legitimate claims to the throne uh, they, it was kind of even at first and then there was some friction that stemmed from the fact that if Batar married Temujin's mom that would make him his stepdad slash brother and, and bro what the fuck is going on in these mongol camps fam because this sounds like a bad vince mcmahon storyline or you, what kind of hub shit is this you feel me but the rivalry in between Temujin and his brother Batar came to a head when Temujin and his younger brother they jumped Batar and they killed him. He he, he had to go. I'm not I'm not playing none of that either, fam. So I agree with him on that. But around this time, he also met another young boy of noble Mongol descent named uh, descent named Jamuka, and they became very close. And I'll talk more about their relationship in a minute. But Batar's brother Belgute didn't try to get revenge. He didn't want no get back for his brother's death or nothing like that he didn't want no revenge on Temujin instead he became one of the Temujin's most trusted advisors and was one of the most skilled fighters in the empire now there were times that other tribes had kidnapped Temujin when he was uh, when they were under this whole shun or getting you know shunned from the camp but every time he would get kidnapped he would find a way to either escape or he would find a way to charm his way out of it. He was kind of like a Mongolian Julius Caesar. Like, bro, just had a natural charisma about him somehow. And see, that's how I, that's why and how I don't really think that he wasn't that bloodthirsty of a ruler. I mean, there's, uh, there's these instances where he actually had to use some intelligence and some wit to get out of some sticky situations. And there's, I mean, this is the proof of that. So he wasn't just that. There's, there's that evidence right there. But around the age of 15, Temujin returned to uh, Dai Sishen, which I know I'm probably mispronouncing that, but he was trying to marry this girl, Borte, and soon after their marriage, uh, the tribe that Temujin's father kidnapped his mother from, well, they spun the block to get their get back and pulled up with about 300 warriors and raided Temujin's camp and kidnapped both of his wives. So he pleaded, he was trying to beg all the other chieftains to help him in the Mongol camps to try and help him go get his wife back, which I can feel you, bro, like you're trying to get your family back that's hey salute to you fam but the he pleaded to other mongol chieftains and he got help from a chieftain named Togru, uh, togrul and temujin's friend jamuka and they led over twenty thousand troops to get his wives back now after they dismantled the murkits and retrieved temujin's wives it was discovered that his wife was pregnant and really to this day it's unknown whether or not this kid was genghis khan's or the kid of one of her captors who had you know done that to her but re regardless 
Temujin raised the child as his own. And salute to you again. You the father that stepped up, uh, Genghis. But him and Jamuka's relationship grew even closer during this time. And they supposedly camped together in the same tent, in the same bed, for a year and a half. And this is just my Western perspective, or I, I should say my warped Western perspective, that leads me to think that this brotherly relationship is kind of suspect as fuck. Especially after learning about, you know, how Alexander was playing for both teams. But just like anything homoerotic or taboo by today's standards, Mongolian historians maintain that this relationship they had was strictly platonic. You feel me? It was just a different time back then. That's what they'd be trying to say. You know, what's wrong with sleeping in the same sleeping bag with your bros while both of your wives are kidnapped? You know, after Temujin became Khan, he and he had laws that actually banned sodomy between men. Whether or not this included consensual sodomy between men, let's just say, uh, that's really up in the air. We don't really know for a fact which way he swung or what his feelings were with homosexuality or, or stuff like that in general. We just don't know. To say it was one way or the other would just be trying to uh, guess it or uh basically cap at this point but i'm not trying to spread no rumors on a dead man like whatever he prefer he prefers it's none of my business but you know he just some of the, some of the things back then you know through today's lens kind of kind of looking kind of sketch fam you ain't have your own tent bro you the leader of the mongols i'm just saying i'm just saying but that's not the only thing that's up in the air though see there's all there's also a decade of time where Genghis Khan was missing, and what's speculated is that around 1185, Temujin was turning into Temuhim. Yeah, that's right. He was becoming him, and he was gaining a lot of notoriety and fame, and his close followers started calling him Khan of the Mongols, and this is when Jamuka really started to hate. Tensions brewed between the two former best friends for years, and in 1187, they finally went to war. Now, the details are kind of hazy on what exactly happened, but it's consensus that Genghis lost this battle. And what's even more hazy is what the fuck happened to Temujin after the battle. From 1188 to 1196, Temujin, aka Genghis Khan, was MIA except one source. There's one source from the Qin Dynasty that explains everything. It says that during this whole time that he was MIA, Genghis was a slave or a servant to the Qin Dynasty, and he may have trained in combat with the Emperor's Jerkin warriors. Now, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. It's either Jerkin or Jerkin, but the Emperor's Jerkin forces were elite warriors that even the Mongols had high respect for, and they admired their fighting spirit. And I'll, I'll talk more about the Qin Dynasty and the Jerkins in a minute, but Genghis Khan being a servant... Uh, or a warrior for the Qin Dynasty is really the only explanation. It's the only account that we have that points to, hey, this is where this guy was. There's no Mongol accounts. There's no other sources. So we kind of have to take their word for it. But again, China do be capping about history sometimes. And, you know, it would be great for them to be like, ah, like Mongols greatest warrior or whatever was one of our slaves. Yeah, that's cool. You could brag about that all you want. But what happened when he came back? No, I say, yeah, let us know what happened when he came back. He came back and fucked it all up. But, uh, it, like I said, where was I at? I don't know if I'm pronouncing, like I said, if I'm, I don't know if I'm pronouncing the jerkins right. But, uh, when Temujin returned to the steppe region, he immediately realigned himself with Togrul and he helped him regain some territory from one of Togrul's family members who had help from a tribe called the Naimans. Now, after Temujin helped Togrul, he was basically seen as an equal ally and was gaining followers again. And on the other hand, his friend Jamuka is on some scar shit. Me like while Genghis is on his whole like redemption Simba arc, like his boy Jamuka is basically being scar like he is fucking the whole land up. He's mistreating his own followers. He's boiling his own followers alive. Like no not burning them alive. He's boiling them alive. You know how crazy that is, fam? Like that is some psychopathic shit even for that time. So some of Jamuka's people eventually got tired of his shit and defected over to Temujin's side, which I can't really blame them either. They probably was like, hey, this guy got to fucking go. We tired of this shit. So anything is better than this at this point. So they defected over to Temujin's side and Temujin used his new allies to basically dismantle the Jerkin tribe, not the 
Chin Dynasty Jerkins is a whole different dirt, uh, Jerkin tribe. This is this was even before the new boys dropped twos, but Genghis tied them down all on the road. If they ain't claim Mongol, then you know they had to go. Whatever, well, right now. No, I'm just playing, but for real. Uh, uh, Temujin uh, took over the Jerkins block, killed their leaders, and the Jerkin forces were now the Mongol forces. And around 1201, three tribes, three tribes clicked up in order to try and go against Togru and, Jemu er, and uh, Temujin's alliance. And Temujin saw this, or he technically heard about it, and this is when he really decided to get on his state property shit, and either these remaining tribes were going to get down, or they were going to lay down. The three tribes that clicked, that clicked up against Temujin were the Tartars, the Tai, Ch the tai Chuid, um, I know I'm butchering that, and the Onagrats, and they basically named Jamuka as their leader. They just so happened to name Jamuka as their leader. Crazy, right? But this loose affiliation between these three tribes didn't last long because Temujin, Togru, and their armies dismantled them at the Battle of Yeti Kunan. And between 1201 and 1203, Temujin and his Mongol forces defeated every tribe in the steppe region, killed their leaders, then absorbed their remaining soldiers in their army. Yeah, the Mongol army was pretty much the equivalent of Cell from Dragon Ball. You don't beat your ass and then steal your powers. Only there wasn't some 17-year-old kid with plot armor to stop them. This included both Jamukas and Togul's respective tribes. See, Togul tried to plot against Temujin and some farmers had overheard him and told Genghis. So, Genghis eventually got up with him and he Togru was killed fleeing battle. And he also finally caught up with Jamuka in 1204. And after his own people turned on him finally, I guess more people turned on him, uh, he, Genghis Khan killed the people that turned in Jamuka and he either killed Jamuka in battle or he basically decapitated him or something happened. He, but Jamuka was no longer and with Jamuka dead, he was the sole ruler over the entire steppe region. And then after around in 1206, he held a Kurultai, a Kurultai, I don't know how to pronounce it, but it was basically a Mongolian powwow with all of the other tribe chiefs and military leaders or what was left of them. And it was at this gathering at the Onan River in 1206 that Temujin formally accepted the title of Genghis Khan. And really... To be honest, we don't even know what the fuck Genghis Khan means. We don't have the definitive uh, translation for what it really means. It could be just a title. It could be just like a little pet nickname. I don't know what it was, but that's when Temujin became the Genghis Khan. And keep in mind, he's 40 or 50 by this time because we there's a little 10-year gap where we don't know when he was born. But... He's 40 or 50 when he does this. He's not young by any means. Alexander died when he was 33. Attila, I don't even think, lived that long. But then you got this guy who's just now beginning his rulership at 50 and beginning his conquest of the world. And he didn't even know that he was about to conquer the world. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. But that, the Onan River uh, powwow that they had, it basically solidified Genghis Khan as the biggest stepper in the steppe region. And from here, he began his plans to try and conquer China since he united all of the tribes of the Eurasian steppe region. I mean, what else was there to do? A lot of people think that the Great Wall of China was built specifically to keep out the Mongolians, but the concept and the construction of the Great Wall started before Jesus was even born, let alone Genghis Khan. But Yes, some of the sections were specifically built to keep the Mongol hordes at bay, but it was also built to keep out other tribes not affiliated with Imperial China in general. But once Genghis united those tribes, the Great Wall was merely a speed bump in the way of the Mongol forces. Genghis began planning his conquest in 1206. He didn't even begin the conquest until March of, 12, of 1211. He had over 2 million people at his command, so in that five years, he positioned himself as almost like a godlike figure to his people. There was nobody above him. And let me just say, he was a humble god. Let me just, like, he would actually throw feasts for his people, let them cut off any piece of, like, a cow or whatever kind of livestock or animal that they had. 
would throw some veggies in there and he would actually cook for his people he would he would be the one cooking it and he would serve all of his people and he would of course eat last or whatever but bro was actually down for his 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 people as much as they was down for him but he he nobody everybody knew not to go against his word or question his leadership type shit because they knew what was going on with that he also made sure that his close family and friends had the highest societal positions possible because, I mean, what good is being a ruler without, you know, engaging in a little nepotism? And on top of that, he, he restructured his army and its whole command structure, is, as even some autonomous tribes had pledged support for the Mongol movement. They was like, bro, I mean, we're going to do our own thing. But you just tell us where to go and what to do, and we gonna do it because we ride that hard for you and what you got going on. So by 1210, Genghis and the Mongols conquered the Xia dynasty, which is a modern day northern China. And after the Xia emperor surrendered, Genghis was really feeling himself. He saw how luxurious people lived beyond the Great Wall, and he he couldn't get enough of it. He wanted it all. He got a taste of it by defeating the Xia dynasty. And now the only thing standing between him and world domination and, and all of the finest things in life was the Qin dynasty and Genghis was a former slave to this empire of the Qin dynasty I talked about that earlier but one of the reasons why he starting started planning his conquest in 1206 was because he learned that the Qin empire had internal instabilities that he felt that he could exploit if he could make it there he also wanted revenge for the crucifixion and execution of Ambagai who was the cousin of Genghis's grandfather. And overall, the Jerkins and the Qin dynasty were the arch nemesis of the Mongols. They just, they had natural beef. It was like owls and ravens, man. They did not fuck with each other. But in 1209, uh, a new Qin emperor took the throne and he tried to press the Mongols for a yearly tribute. And in 1210, Genghis Khan decided to answer him. He pulled up with all of his his men and all of his army spat on the ground and then rode away and this was a sign of ultimate disrespect this infuriated the emperor he this was an act of war he was livid so little did he know though that genghis wanted all the smoke this is exactly what he wanted he said bro i am about to take all your shit so you can go ahead and try and attack me but you know what it is with me and really the Qin dynasty held their own for a minute right up until their their own government leaders started to turn against each other and then a plague broke out so then Genghis was like oh y'all are down real bad I'm gonna let my my little homies my war generals kind of deal with y'all I'm gonna be back to lay the law down but y'all gotta get that disease shit taken care of I don't know what y'all got going on over there but I, I'm gone I'll, I'll be back though but with the Sia the Song and the Qin dynasties pretty much all conquered Genghis was now the sole ruler over all of Asia the Great Wall, the Silk Road, China, all that shit was Mongols who had now. By 1215, Genghis Khan was running Asia by himself, and his kingdom bordered the Khorasmian Empire, which I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but basically it was a Muslim empire, and they had Central Asia, Persia, and Afghanistan on lock. So, whether or not Genghis was trying to spy on the Khorasmians or if he was just trying to be neighborly is up for debate but in 1218 he sent some merchants and traders over to Khorasmia or Khorasmia I don't know how to pronounce it but like I said I know I'm butchering it but the Shah was suspicious the leader of the area was suspicious so he accused one of the merchants of being a spy whether or not he was it up for debate because you know Genghis Khan was known to spy on motherfuckers that's one thing that he kind of invented no cap but i'll talk more about that in a minute so the merchants they they all had to go not like leave the city but they had to leave the earth when genghis heard that the Khwarazmians massacred the merchants he sent an ambassador with another two companions and the Khwarazmians murdered the ambassador basically publicly humiliated the two companions stripped him naked and then sent him back to Genghis like bro we're not playing with you bro like don't do some shit like that again like we if you really won't come over here we'll give you this smoke so by 1220 Genghis and the Mongols obliterated and sieged what used to be the Khwarazmia Empire in the Middle East and Russia this campaign is really mainly why Genghis is demonized for good reason too the, the three 
wealthiest cities in the world at the time were in the Khwarazmian Empire, and since most of the empire refused to submit to the Mongols, including those three cities, the Mongols decimated the cities to the point of being unrecognizable. Like, over a million people were slaughtered by the Mongols during this campaign alone. And there's one legend of the Mongols dumping so many books in the Nile River that it turned black from all the ink. But, the Mongols were never in Africa, so I'm pretty sure that's Cap. But, what isn't Cap is by the time, by the time that the, all the conquests of Genghis Khan were done, 11% of the Earth's population was wiped out. Like, no one is touching bros KD. Hitler himself probably didn't even see nobody die for real or even kill anybody himself. The bubonic plague couldn't even put up Genghis Khan's numbers. And they played in the same era. Like, that's crazy. The, the plague was moving faster than some Mongol on horseback. And it still couldn't even put up the kind of death rate that the Mongols were putting up. But by the time Genghis had finished the Khwarazmia campaign... There were some revolts in China that needed to be quelled, so he returned to China, and he went back to Mongolia in 1225 to presumably plan a march into either Europe or Russia, but before he could do that, he died in 1227. I mean, maybe 1227. We actually don't know because the Mongols kept his death straight up hidden. Nobody even really knows when exactly he died. They were incredibly secretive with burial rituals to begin with. And, I mean, you are taking over the whole world. And once the whole world knows that the man who took it over is dead, oh, yeah, bro, you're about to have a whole bunch of, a whole bunch of riots and shit on your hands. You're about to have a whole lot of unrest as to what happens next. But... I mean, to this day, we still have no idea how Genghis Khan died or where he's buried. Now, supposedly a river runs over his gravesite, making it impossible to find, but there's so many rumors and conspiracy theories and mysteries surrounding his death that it's really anybody's guess as to what happened and where he's at. Arguably, the greatest conqueror in the world, and his death and burial place is a mystery to this day. Now, here's where I push back on the people that say that he's only a warmonger who only wanted to rape and kill people and all that. If you wanted to build an empire based solely on raping and pillaging, the Vikings should have and could have had a way bigger empire, but they didn't because they didn't have the leadership or, or the manpower that the Mongols did. I mean, they were maybe just as skilled warriors but maybe not on horseback though the mongols would have tore their ass up they were too quick and too much for them but uh like i said painting genghis khan as an illiterate barbarian is a gross misre misrepresentation of history genghis had underrated administrative skills and one of his generals named Su uh, subutai is regarded as one of the greatest military strategists in history Period. And he actually existed, maybe, unlike Sun, unlike Sun Tzu. But Belgude, who I mentioned earlier, his, his half-brother or whatever, he was another brilliant military leader. And he lived to be 97 years old, which was like being Methuselah in that era. And his grandson, uh, Genghis' grandson, Kublai Khan, is one of the greatest politicians of all time and was a successful emperor in China in his own right. Not only that, Genghis himself was a master strategist. There's also stories of him saving women and children from being attacked by his men i mean he's looked at unfavorably in the middle east but as i've researched his tactics he usually offered cities a chance to surrender instead of like instead of just sacking them off rip maybe like vikings or whatever he actually would come to them and be like hey bro like you could surrender or we're about to come through and just burn all this shit down and make it ours anyway so you could kind of take your pick and you could kind of tell which which People took their options and which ones didn't because the Khwarazmians, they got burnt the fuck up. But, uh, I, I, like I said, uh, besides he, besides all of that, uh, all of his battle tactics, he did invent an early mail system so his armies could communicate more effectively. He had a justice system within his empire. He was a firm believer in crime and punishment. Women in the Mongol Empire were valued members of society and could own land. I mean, they weren't as high in the hierarchy structure as men, but I mean, they were still important. I mean, we've, we've lived in America where at one point in time, women couldn't get 
bank accounts and here in the mongol culture they were just they were property owners fam that's that that hit a little different you feel me that feminism in mongol culture was hitting but uh overall Genghis Khan did commit atrocities. I'm not going to sit here and pretend like he didn't kill 11% of the population and destroy a lot of history. I mean, as a his, as a motherfucker who loves history, that shit hurts my heart. So it's kind of like fuck Genghis Khan, but damn, bro, he was he was great. And I mean, he did commit almost borderline genocide but he also made contributions to the world that we still see in use today the man went from tribal outcast to ruler of the world he conquered the known world and discovered the unknown unlike alexander and attila his empire actually lasted quite a while after his death and even expanded after he died so i mean someone told me that gang if someone told me that genghis khan is the greatest ruler of all time he kind of got a solid case if you think it's somebody else i'm all ears leave a comment on maybe somebody else who was a great ruler or a, a great emperor in history and, and maybe i'll cover him in a future video or something if you like this video leave a like uh subscribe and, and ring the damn bell so you could stay tuned for all the hot history content that i got dropping soon because i do got more of that on the way and uh either way Genghis Khan is a bona fide legend in history, hands down, no cap, no gown, no doubt about it, and like I said, I hope y'all enjoyed, I've just been playing a little bit of Tekken recently, and uh, yeah, I'm gonna do some little uh, biblical stories next, I don't know, I'm probably gonna get a lot of flack for that shit, but fuck it y'all, uh, it's been your boy. A N T repping the game gang. Be safe, y'all. Don't get smoked. I'm out. Peace.